Good morning. How are you doing? Are you for real doing great? How many people wish you were still in bed? Don't respond, please. I don't want to know. <laughs> but anyways, welcome. My name is Jeremy. I get the awesome privilege and honor to pastor this church, and it really is an honor. It's just to be able to have the opportunity to to cultivate and create a community that's after Jesus. And our whole motto here is that we want to awaken and empower you to follow Jesus. And, and, and what that comes down to is we want to awaken you to what God is doing in your life, whether that's salvation or if that's the calling and the purposes that God has for you. And then what we want to do is empower you. We want to equip you to follow that path. And so that's, that's our desire, and that's our longing for you here at Vertical Life. And we don't want you to walk away with our names on your lips saying, hey, Vertical is great. We want you to walk away saying, man, I'm in love with Jesus even more. That, that is our goal. That is our desire, and that's what we're after. And, in fact, we're going to be having some DNA classes coming up here soon, which basically we're going to start running them every month. And what it is, it'll give you an opportunity, kind of just a crash course to learn about this culture, to find out what we're about, to see how you can get plugged in, because it takes more than just a couple people to, to build a community and to build a church. It takes a family of people. Amen. And so it's an opportunity for you to kind of plug in and get involved and see how you can uh, be a part here at Vertical Life. And not only how you can be a part, but to know what you can expect from us as your, as your body. Amen. You guys, are, are you guys going to be a quiet bunch for me today? Because you know I don't like quiet bunches. I like just some feedback and uh, so if you hear something that's good to you, even if it's not good, just shout amen. You can throw something at me if you want, wave a hanky, just get kind of excited, and, and let's just make this a wonderful a morning where we can just learn about God. So we're in this, uh, new, this new series. This is part two, and the, the title of the series is called Dear, and it has a line with a little uh, uh, comma after it. And basically what this series is about, it's a, it's a, it's a group of messages on Ephesians. And the reason there's no name after dear is because I want you to put your name there. I want this to be a series of messages that were as if they were letters written to you that would apply to your life. And last week, we covered the first part of Ephesians, Ephesians 1. And what we were looking at is how, how Paul placed his confidence in Jesus and how often we misplace our confidence. And, and when we misplace our confidence, we often shipwreck our faith. And how a lot of times there's people who are going through difficult seasons or, or, or are on the sideline. And, and it's usually the result of they place their confidence in the wrong thing. And what I mean is you place it in something else other than Jesus' love for you. And so we were just talking about that and diving into it. And this second week we're going to, we're going to um, look at the next part of Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verse 15 through 23. And just so you know, I mean, there's some people, you're, you're, you may be new to Christianity, all this stuff is new, you don't even know what Ephesians is, and to kind of give you a little bit of context, it's, it's a letter written by a man named Paul. Now, to understand who Paul is, Paul used to be this a religious elite guy who would go around and he would persecute the church. He, that's, that was his sole goal, was to, to kind of stamp out the church, to stop it. And he had an encounter with Jesus that completely changed his life. And as a result, he ended up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. And he went around planting churches and poured his life into the church. And here he is. He's writing this letter. And it's important for you to know that he's writing this letter from a prison cell. That's where he's writing it from. He's writing it in his heart, even in prison, even in this place of, of, of what doesn't seem good for him. He's still thinking about the church, and he writes this letter. And this is what he says in, in verse 15 through 23. He says, For this reason, because, I've, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And so he's basically saying, I've heard of what God's doing in your life. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And then comma, and then there's a that. And I'm going to explain what that, that is here in a second. But first, what's going on here is Paul is saying that I've heard of what God's doing in your life. And I'm encouraged by it. And, and I'm going to persistently pray 
that God continues to do his work in you by doing these three things. And these are the three things that he's praying. The first one is that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That's so important. You know, I'll be honest with you. When I put a message together, I always ask myself this question. Who cares? Like, who cares? Like, a lot of times we can hear so many teachings and we can hear it and then we can just walk away and, and really never apply it to our life. And, and when we have a teaching team, we have a teaching team, and when they come up here, they share with me what they want to say, and then I ask them this question, who cares? Like, how is it going to change or impact anybody's life? Because there's this idea that sometimes that Christianity is just this routine thing we do. We just kind of walk in and we walk out. We, 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 we raise our hand a little bit in worship and we move on in our life. And that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to completely change and alter the way that you live. And so the first thing that Paul is praying here that you would understand is that you would know the new life that Jesus has called you to. That you would understand it. Because this is the thing, guys. This is why it's important. You can't fulfill a call that you don't know about. And that's what he's praying here. He's praying that, I pray that you would see the hope that you have in Jesus. That you would just see it. That you would see what you've been called to. That you've been called, been called to be higher than what the way that you're living right now. We settle for Little things too often. And here he is, he's praying and, 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 and persistently praying that you would see what God has called you to, the hope of one of salvation in Jesus Christ and also the new life that that empowers you to have. And so that's the first thing that he's praying. And then he goes on here in the next part, he says, this is the second thing. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What are the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints? And here, if I was to kind of break it down, is that you would understand how valuable you are to God. How valuable you are to him. Something happens in the relationship when you no longer have to question your value to the other person. It does something. Because this is the thing, you cannot grow in a relationship that you're questioning the commitment of the other party in. You can't. You're always unstable. You're always unsure. You can't move past that because you're so concerned if this person is committed to that relationship or not. You know, some, some of you might be in those kind of situations right now or maybe you've dated someone where it's just always unstable because you were unsure of the commitment. There's a freedom that comes over your life when you no longer have to question the commitment of the other person. And there's a freedom that will happen in your life when you realize and understand the value that you have before God. And so that's what he's praying here. He's praying, first off, he's praying that you will see the things that God's called you to. And then also that you would understand how valuable you are to him. How valuable you are to him. And then he continues on in, in part three of this. He says in verse 19, he says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? That word immeasurable is interesting. It's, it, it refers to another sphere, another atmosphere. It's like of this other world. The power is so great, it's, you can't really even comprehend it. And the reason that this is important is because you need to understand the power that is on your side through Jesus Christ. Because let's be honest, let's be honest. Often we have more confidence in our sin, in our weakness, in our inability than we do in God's ability to redeem and restore us. Think about that. A lot of times during a week, you have more faith in the fact that you're going to fall and that you think you'll never get out of this situation, that you always struggle, that you always struggle with whatever that struggle is, than you do in God's redeeming power in your life. And the, you got to understand that he is able to redeem you and restore you in any situation that you're in right now, that that when he's on your side, you can't lose. And the reason that's important, because some of you, you're facing some st tough stuff. You're, you're wrestling with sin. You're, you're struggling. You're like, I just went out of this. I don't want to do this anymore. Anyone in here? Anyone? Am I the only one? I'll raise my hand. There's situations where I just want freedom from this area of my life or, or whatever. And, 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 and you almost feel like it's hopeless. And it's not hopeless. And this is why it's so important for you to understand this, because you will not stay in the battle that you think you're going to lose. 
You're not going to. You will not stay in a battle that you think you will lose or you lose all hope in. And you got to understand what, that God is able to do more than you can even expect or even imagine. In fact, in Jude chapter 1, verse 24, I think they're going to pull it up here. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Now to him who is able sometimes. Wait. Now to him who is able only when. Wait. No, it says that he is able, does it not? So you got to understand that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, you serve a God who's able in your life. He's able, and that's what's going to help keep you in the fight. That's what's going to help give you confidence. And so you can see what he's doing here. He's praying these things, and he's, he's, he's persistently and consistently praying these things over the people's lives that he's leading. And then he continues on. He says, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So he's saying that, listen, this power, he's greater than anything you can imagine. Even then and now, there's nothing that will ever be greater than him. And he continues on, he says in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Those are awesome things. How many people would say, like, I would love all three of those in my life. I would love to have a greater clarity of what Jesus has done for me, the salvation, so I don't have to toil anymore wondering if God loves me or not. And that I would, I would, I would understand and have peace and, and, and confidence knowing that he's able to get me through the situation, that I'm not defined by my mistake, but I'm defined by who he says I am. And then that is where I'll stand. And then that is what I'll walk in. That's where my confidence will be. How many people will say, I would like to have more of that in my life? Those are great things to pray are they not in fact the reality is these are what they call Pauline prayers and I used to have a list of them I encourage you you go through through the letters of Paul and you pull out where he prayed and you write it down I actually think I have them in the back of this Bible and I would just pray them over my life just pray those verses over your life they're called the Pauline prayers I think it's a good habit to get into just pray these things over your life but I also think that prayers reveal something about ourselves. And what I mean by that is what we pray about usually reveals what's on our heart, right? It reveals, it reveals like our theology, the way we view God. It reveals our concerns. I mean, a lot of times what you're praying about is probably a concern of yours, right? It, it reveals a lot about you. And I also think it reveals a lot about your fears. And maybe I'm taking a little bit of liberty here, but I, I personally think that this prayer reveals one of Paul's fears. And I'll get to that here in a second. But first, can I tell you about my kids? Is that okay? <laughs> so I have four children. Dear God, help me now. You can, you can pray for me. I have four children. And um, I actually wanted to have five, believe it or not. But my wife said it's done. It's over. And so, uh, but I, I, we have four children, and they're, they're wonderful children, and uh, ages from 10, which is Lucas, all the way down to the smallest, which he'll be two uh, this next month. And um, every night, usually it's the routine that I put the three oldest to bed, and Nicole puts the smallest one to bed. And so we have a routine, and if, and if you know, that routine is, can be agonizing. If you have a kid and you put any kids to bed before, it's just, it's just oh my goodness, it's, it can be stressful. And so you're trying to get them in the bed, and at the last minute, they have all these requests. Like, all of a sudden, they're hungry, and all of a sudden, they're thirsty. All of a sudden, they, you know, whatever it is, I have a boo-boo or something. It just, it doesn't matter what it is. Their object or their, their goal is to, to avoid going to bed. That's it. And so um, I'll put them in bed, and, and I want to get back down, downstairs, and they come back downstairs, and 
Then you put them back in bed. And it's kind of funny because you can hear them running around and they think that you can't hear them. <laughs> like it sounds like a herd of elephants up there going around. And then you, you start walking up the steps and you're, they run right back as soon as you start walking up the steps. Anybody, you ever, you ever do that? Like you start walking up the steps, they're back to their, to their beds. And, and uh, well, every night, probably about 98, 99% of the time, I say a prayer over them. And it's the same prayer every time. It doesn't change. And it's just kind of a, this routine thing. And, and the prayer kind of goes like this. I, I, I say, I pray that the law of the spirit of life will set you free from the law of sin and death. That sin will not and cannot manifest in your life physically, spiritually, or mentally in the name of Jesus. And it's to the point now they finish it. Because sometimes, sometimes I'll pause. And in Jesus' name. Or and mentally. And emo, like they just kind of finish it for me. And then I continue on and I say Father, I thank you that they would fear and love you and that they would have a friend and a spouse that fears and loves you. And then I finish with this. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encounter them, that you would encounter them. And this is my reason. One is because I believe that it doesn't matter how many times they sit in a Sunday service. It doesn't matter if they're sitting on the front row doesn't matter how many teachings they hear. They have to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Like, I believe that's what changes their life. Like, non-negotiable, that's what changes your life. It even says that no man can come to me unless my spirit draws him. And so I pray that. But also, it's a fear of mine. Because as my kids get older, I'm afraid that they will know about God and not know God. It bothers me. And I think in a similar manner here, Paul is afraid that the church will know about God, but not know God. You got to realize where he came from. He came from a place where he studied God. That was his thing. He was, a, he was like the cream of the crop. He, he, he went to all the seminaries and went to the best one. And he had all his theology, probably whatever, in a, in a row, correct. But he didn't know God. He did not know God, and he had this fear and this burden that they would return back to the law. That was a fear of his. And so I believe that what one of his fears were that they would know about God and not know God, that they would practice Christianity and never understand or know the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I could borrow this fear... That's my fear for you and for myself. My fear is that you would know about God, but not know God. I feel like that's a big thing in Christianity today. It's just knowing about him, but not knowing him. The life change doesn't happen in knowing about God. It happens in knowing him. And that's why it's so important. If you, if you walk away with anything today, I want you to write this down. I want you to, to hold on to this. God doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know him. God doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know him. I love how another pastor says it. He says God doesn't want to be studied. He wants to be known. I think too often we just study him and we don't don't know him. And I'll be honest, I think for some of us, that's probably scary to know him. For others, it's exciting. And the reason it's scary is because you like control. In religion, you can control it. You can control when you come to church on Sunday morning between 10 and 11, 15, or 11, 20, 11, 30. You can, you can control that and put that there. But when you have a relationship with someone, you can't, it changes things. It's funny kind of hearing about married couples who are newly married and they went from not living together and having their routine of life to becoming married. It kind of changes a lot of things, does it not? Because there's, it's a relationship. And I would say this, if your life hasn't been messed up because of the gospel, then you don't know God. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you don't know him. Because he'll mess your world up. Everything changes after an encounter with him, everything changes from a, 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 being in a relationship with him. And I believe that this is Paul's fear. Is that you would just attend church on Sundays. Maybe attend a community group and maybe get your, 
daily Bible sprinkle thing on. I think it's called Jesus sprinkle or something like that. But never know him. I think, you know, we were in a, a community group the other day, and Stephen, he's a friend of mine, he serves back there on the soundboard and helps a lot around here, Stephen Alexander, and he, we were talking just about church and different things, and he made this statement, he's like, he painted this awesome analogy, I thought it was great, he said, it's like this waterfall, like the presence of God, and it's just this waterfall coming down. And God is inviting you in. He's inviting the people in. And we're referring to Holly Springs. He's like, he's inviting Holly Springs in. But so many people are satisfied with just standing on the outside and getting a little bit of the mist. And they feel like they've had an encounter, but they were never even in the waterfall. We're settling for mists when we can have the waterfall. And that's what Paul is calling us into. And that's what he's praying for you and I to know and to encounter and to live from. A relationship with God. But too often we settle for routines and religion when he wants relationship. And that's what will change everything about your life. And this is, you need to understand this. When I, the kingdom, and when I say the kingdom, I'm referring to Christianity in the way of the, the way of the God, like the kingdom of God. It, it, another way to put it is, I, I like to say, if, if Jesus was the mayor of Holly Springs, what would it look like? Like if it was under his domain. And so when I say kingdom, I'm referring to Christianity and his leadership. And the kingdom was never intended to operate outside of relationship with the king. Like you were never, Christianity was never intended to be a religion. Jesus came to break religion to establish a relationship. And what Paul's fear is, is that we will go back to a religion. And in this time, he was wrestling with his big time because people would come into a church that he planted and try to call them back to legalism and the old covenant and these old ways and to lean on that and not lean into Jesus. And so... If you don't have a relationship with the king, Christianity will quickly turn into religion and it will kill you. It will spiritually kill you. The thing that changes everything, everything, is relationship with him. That's what changes everything. And so if you and I were to say we're going to have a cup of coffee. This is not coffee, by the way. I pretend it is, but it's actually water. But if we were to have a cup of coffee and we're sitting and we're, and we're having a, and you were asking me a question, you said, hey, Jeremy, how, how do I go from a relationship of, or how do I go from religion to relationship? How do I go from routine to relationship? This is, this is what I'll tell you. I will give you two points, okay? Two things is what I would say. I'm not saying this is the, the only answer. I'm not saying that this is, there's, not, there's nothing else. This is if you and I were sitting down and we're having a, quite, a conversation. The first thing I would say is this right here. We're going to put it all up on the slide. Stop being a Christian and become a spirit-filled lover of Jesus. Stop being a Christian and become a spirit-filled lover of Jesus. The reason I say stop being a Christian because I think being a Christian is just a label. It means, it means nothing. 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 And what I want to challenge you to do is to just drop that label and follow him. And some of us, if we were honest with ourselves, we need to hit reset on our relationship with God. We, we, over these years, we piled on so much junk and so much theology and doctrines and teachings and podcasts and this person's opinion and that person's opinion that it can get overwhelming and confusing, right? And what we need to do is just say, you know what, Jesus, I'm hitting a reset on this. And I'm starting fresh. And I want to just pursue you and be in relationship with you. To, I'm going to choose relationship over religion. And What's interesting is that Jesus also wrote a letter to the Ephesian church. And I find it kind of 
weird because what Jesus is saying here, in a way, reveals that Paul's fear became true. That the church ended up replacing relationship with religion. Watch what he says. This is what Jesus says. It's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. He's writing to the Ephesian church. He says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Okay, so let me kind of tell you what's going on. He's saying, like, I know you're doing everything right. Like, those are good things. You're doing good things. But it's become a routine. And you've allowed routine to replace relationship. And here's what he says here in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. And I think that's what's happened to many people, many Christians, even in this room right here. You, you're, you're faithful. Like you do, you, you're, you're faithful to your scripture reading. You're faithful to attend church. You're, you're faithful to do certain things. But the thing that you've abandoned, that you've walked away from, is that relationship. And now this thing is just a routine. And there's no life in it anymore. There's no life in it more, anymore because... The kingdom was never intended to operate outside of a relationship with the king. The life change happens not in what you know and not in just your routine. It happens in the relationship. And so would Jesus say that to you this morning? Man, you're doing so well. And you've been so faithful. But I have this against you. I miss you. I miss you. And I think that will be a word for some of you guys right now. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would penetrate your heart, if that's you, with this one whisper, I miss you. I miss you. Come away with me. Come and spend time with me. Everything else can wait. Just be with me. So that's why I say stop being a Christian. Because it's not just a label. And the second part of that statement is a spirit-filled lover of Jesus. I want you to notice something of how Paul says this transformation is going to happen. I want, if we can, we can reverse back up to verse 16. If we can pull that passage in Ephesians back up. And this is what he says. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and this is how he says this is going to be done, may give you what? May give you what? In revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So what he is saying is he's saying that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is going to do this work inside of you. And that's why I put spirit-filled lover of Jesus on here. And I know for some people, the Holy Spirit seems like some spooky thing. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as God the Father and God the Son. Just as much God as God the Father and God the Son is God the Holy Spirit. And in Christianity today, we have a, we, we're, we're in danger of closely coming to God the Father, God the Son, or the Holy Father, Holy Son, and the Holy Bible. And we just put the Spirit over on the side. And that's a dangerous place to be. And I understand there's probably all kinds of thoughts of the Spirit. And when you say the Holy Spirit, we think he's spooky. No, he's not spooky. He is mysterious, though. And he is a being. And we can't quench him. But the only way that you're going to see and know God and the kingdom is through his Holy Spirit. That's who he sent to teach us and to guide us and to enlighten us. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 12 through 15. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. What he's saying is like, I have so much that I want to tell you, but you do not have the capacity the ability to contain or hold or know or to see or to hear what I really want to say to you. Like, you don't have it. You can't. 
And then he continues on and says, when the spirit of truth comes, he, not me, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, it's almost like he's re- like just putting his foot down on it. I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so I genuinely believe that your ability to see and walk in the kingdom of God is through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. And we neglect him so much, and he's just here to guide us and teach us and comfort us. And I know there's some crazy things that happen in the name of the Holy Spirit. But I have this analogy. I've used this many times before, and I want to use it here. If you take a hammer, just a a carpenter's hammer, if you take a hammer, and I give it to my, actually, we'll say I give it to my nephew, Silas. (laughs) And I let him go. Inside of a gift shop, what do you think is going to happen? Any guesses? A lot of broken items, right? Now, what we would not do is disqualify the hammer and just throw it away. Say the hammer's no good. What we would do is discipline and teach Silas what a hammer is for and what it's not for. And I think what we've done in the church is we've dismissed the spirit because of abuse in his name. Now, this is what you got to be careful, that there has been abuse done in the name of the Spirit, just like there has been abuse done in the name of Christianity, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Word, the Scripture, all kinds of things. But do not dismiss the one friendship, the one partnership, the one entity, the one thing that God said that you must have in your life to see the kingdom, to hear Him, and to walk out this thing called Christianity, and that's the Holy Spirit. Do not dismiss it. And Paul, Paul reconfirms this later on in another letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. And I'll be honest, these Corinthians, they were a crazy group of people. I mean, they were insane. And in fact, they were crazy even with, they were, there was spiritual abuse with gifts. But he never told them to stop. He said to eagerly pursue it, but to do it with wisdom and love. And so this group of people he's writing this letter to, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 11 through 14, he says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. Let me say that again. The natural person does not accept The things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not what? Able to what? Able to what? He is not able to understand them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. You cannot see the kingdom. You cannot walk in it without a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm saying that you're handicapped. You're handicapped. So what does this mean? for? Okay, Jeremy, so you tell me, like, I need to have this relationship with the Spirit. And we're going to do a whole series on the Holy Spirit. But I I just want to leave you with a, I want to give you a couple thoughts before I give my last principle on that. And one is, a prerequisite for the Spirit is that you're thirsty for Him. I want to quote this passage, John 7, 37 through 39. And I want you to read what Jesus says. 
He says, I know your works. Look, that's not it. John chapter 7 says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And a lot of times we stop there. I mean, I don't know if you've heard that passage before, but a lot of times it's quoted and it stops there. Why? Because people think the Holy Spirit is the crazy uncle that you keep in the basement and you try not to invite them to the, to the family reunion. But he continues on. And he says, now this he said about who? The Spirit. Whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But you can see in there a prerequisite is a thirst. You got to want a relationship with him. I think too often, like I grew up in a, a pretty aggressive spiritual environment. And too often, I think sometimes they just made you drink. You're going to drink no matter what. You know, they just kind of forced it on you. I think that's wrong. I think there has to be a prerequisite in, in your heart, a desire. Like I thirst for him. I thirst for you. Holy Spirit, I thirst for you. And I pray even now, Holy Spirit, that you will awaken the thirst in people's hearts for you. And then you ask, Holy Spirit, teach me. Like when you sit down and read scripture, just ask him, Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do in this situation? Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, comfort me. Cultivate that relationship with him. He's not spooky, guys. He's mysterious, but he's not spooky. And the second point, and this is the point I want to close out with, because I told you I will give you two things. I'm not a man that I'm going to lie to you. The second thing is simple obedience. Simple obedience. You know, I'm getting closer to 40. I'm 37. And so I've noticed that my jokes are kind of like going over to those old man dad jokes. And so this is probably one of them. But have you ever heard of the saying YOLO? Right, YOLO? Is that too long ago? YOLO, does anyone? I have one I want to say for this <laughs> principles for you is ALO. All right, ALO. So if you're wondering what I want to do, just ALO. And the first thing is ask. Just ask God what to do in this situation. Like, just ask him. When you ask, you're acknowledging that there is a relationship. Just ask. And then when you ask, like, Father, what do you want me to do in this situation? What do you want me to do in this relationship? Then what you need to do that is the L, which is listen. Listen for his voice and you will hear it. The problem is most of us, we're not listening for his voice. We just make our own decisions up. We, we don't even bother asking. We just make up our own mind in this situation when you can just stop and ask and listen. And then the real exciting part is obey. A-L-O, hello. I know it's corny, I'm sorry. And I guarantee you, you will see a change in your life, if you begin to apply those things to your life, one, that you stop being a Christian and become a spirit-filled follower of Jesus, and two, simple obedience. Those two things, I guarantee you, will wreck your life. I guarantee you will wreck your life. Change it completely. You will never be the same. You think Christianity is boring? Do those couple things and watch everything 
will change. Amen. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to just hit reset on our relationship with God. How many people in here, as the worship team comes out, how many people in here, you would say, you know what, I, I, I need to set, hit reset in some areas in my life. Anybody in here? This is what I want you to do. We're going to stand up. And we're going to sing this one song. And I love this song. And I think it's a, just a, a great way just to say, God, you know.